Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, sorry, back. And Brazil would be second with 232 million, or 23% of all the cows. And yet, YouTube refuses to pay me in cows, and Patreon doesn't even let me make a choice to receive donations in cows. Pig also used to be the word for a young pig, while the word swine was used for the whole species. Which means someday piglet could come to mean an adult pig, and then we would need to find a new word, probably something like piggle for their babies. The swine as a whole, however, are the domesticated version of the Eurasian boar, which, as the name implies, also kinda had a ginormous range throughout Europe and Asia. But it's thought more anciently they originated out of Southeast Asia around two- Boars seem like such a, uh a good animal when i say good just uh successful like they, they're super aggressive i feel like they can eat a lot of things and they're pretty hardy like tough and i'm i'm not sure what their birth rate is it's probably pretty high and so i, I just i'm not surprised that they're a successful animal spread across two continents. Eurasian boar, which, as the name implies, also kinda had a ginormous range throughout Europe and Asia, but it's thought more anciently they originated out of Southeast Asia around two million years ago. However, they were domesticated in more or less the same exact place as cows within the Tigris River Basin, likely South Central Turkey as well. Since Turkey seems to be very popular so far, let's talk about turkeys next. I was surprised to find that turkeys actually did get their name from the country Turkey, but maybe not in the way you'd expect you see wild turkeys had an original range across north america nowhere yep i'm over here and uh, i see turkeys they, they could be in my backyard near the right country now. of turkey most likely originating in the warm pine forest of mexico but upon finding america europeans realized just how much they liked them and brought them back to the old world quickly turkeys made their way to the ottoman empire which excelled in the trade of a very similar bird the guinea fowl the turkish people came to breed and further domesticate the bird and began distributing it throughout the mediterranean and all the way back to britain from there the bird became associated with those who traded the bird and they became turkish birds birds from turkey and eventually just turkeys i guess the turkish just really love domesticating animals moving on to sheep like all of these sheep had a more wild ancestor called the mouflon from which modern domesticated sheep were bred from these guys looked a thousand times cooler than modern sheep and i definitely want to ride one the original range of mouflons was from the caucasus into yeah anatolia modern day turkey and down into iraq and iran a lot of they were one of the areas. first domesticated animals when 11,000 years ago the mesopotamians domesticated them them. Though it's unclear where exactly in Mesopotamia this happened, who are we kidding? It was probably Turkey. I want to see a sheep are eye. Very similar to eye. sheep, so it only makes sense that they come from roughly the same place and were domesticated at roughly the same time. Except domestic goats likely Wait. came from the wild Bezor. His eye looks fine. At roughly the same time. Except dom see his eye does it doesn't have that. What am I thinking of? I've definitely seen goats with like a weird kind of elongated pupil. Domestic goats likely like, came from almost the like a frog looking of the Bezor ibex, which has some serious horns and actually have the largest horns relative to body size of any animal on earth. These have a range from the Zagros Mountains into yeah Turkey and the Caucasus as well. The term to refer to a baby or a young goat is just kid, so this is just a bunch of kids. This phrase comes from England and is actually older than referring to human children as kids, which originated in America during the 1800s. So yeah, basically calling a child a kid means you're calling them a baby goat. Horses are probably the most awesome of the animals that we eat, and also help in finally getting us out of Mesopotamia. They likely roamed the Pontic steppe from Ukraine through Russia and all the way into Kazakhstan, and it was here that they were also likely domesticated around 6,000 years ago. The earliest irrefutable evidence of horse domestication comes from sites shared between Russia and Kazakhstan, where the horse carcasses were found buried with chariots, clearly indicating they were being used and had been for some time. What? Could an archaeologist have a better freaking site? Look at that. That's like perfectly laid out.
time. A very close relative of the horse is the donkey, which yeah, are also called ass, and a female donkey, now called a jinny, was just called a she-ass. I'm telling you all this not because it's important, but because I have to have fun making these videos too. Despite yeah. being close relatives to the horse, they originated from the African wild ass, which had a range from Egypt all the way down to the Horn of Africa as far as Somalia. However, this region used to be a lot more grassy, and now their true range is centered around Ethiopia. But this original range explains why the donkey was originally domesticated in a place called Nubia by pastoral people in modern day Sudan. Camels are kind of difficult because there's really two different camels. The dromedary, what most of us can I like the furry ones, the ones in like the Asia steppe area. Consider as a regular camel and then the Bactrian camel. Yeah. Dromedaries, also known as Arabian camels, are just that, originating in Arabia and spilling over a bit into North and East Africa. And it was either here in Arabia or in Somalia that they were first domesticated. Whereas Bactrian camels come from, well, Bactria, which is roughly this area, mostly in modern day Afghanistan and Pakistan. Because of their original habitat, it was these types of camels, the Bactrian ones, that were used for the Silk Road. Closely related to camels are llamas and alpacas. Because of their similarities to each other, they're often confused, but they are in fact different animals. The important difference between them is size, as llamas can be up to 6 feet tall, whereas alpacas are smaller, typically only over 4 feet tall. The range of the llama is also bigger, stretching from Ecuador down to Chile and even Argentina, while alpacas can mostly be found within southern Peru and northern Chile. But I wonder if uh, escape, like going into the mountains and being super good at grappling and, and climbing cliffs would be a, a really great way to get out of reach of a lot of predators. You don't want to risk falling, especially when you're trying to catch these things that are just so well adapted. But basically, both can be found within the Andes and are sort of just used as the cows of the Andes Mountains. If that's the case, then the cows of the Himalaya Mountains would be yaks, which are basically cows that grow their own skirts, as they've become adapted for cold and mountainous regions. The most important difference between cows and yaks, however, in my opinion at least, is that while cows moo, yaks grunt, and even their Latin name, Bos Grunius, reflects this, translating into bull grunting. The last two livestock creatures I want to talk about aren't often thought about, Typically, we don't directly eat these, but instead we just use the products they create. The first one is the silkworm. These are the larval stage of the silk moth, which produce, yeah, you guessed it, silk. The wild silk moth has a range. What about fish? Like, uh, haven't certain Asian countries had the, what's it called? Those kind of. Actually, I guess they're pets. They're not used, so they wouldn't be called livestock. Never mind. Start the silk moth, which produce, yeah, you guessed it, silk. They're definitely the salmon wild silk moth has a range starting in northern India and coming all the way up into northern China and even into far eastern Russia. Domestication occurred in China roughly 5,000 years ago, and then the secret of their domestication was closely guarded when outsiders came, and Europeans had to steal silkworms in order to figure it out. It's a very interesting story, but we don't have time for it right now. Lastly, we have the honeybee. Now, some might argue this doesn't count as a domesticated livestock, but they're still an animal that we derive a tremendous amount of value from, both through their honey and wax, but especially through their pollination practices. So I figured I'd include them regardless. Of the 20,000 different bee species that exist on Earth, only seven produce honey. And it's thought that the first honeybees came from Africa and spread naturally across the rest of Eurasia. And today, the most popular one is called the Western honeybee, or sometimes the European honeybee, hint hint. And because Europeans had a lot of fun sailing all around the world and meeting a bunch of new people and Rodman definitely Moore. didn't do anything bad in any of these places, oh, no. the modern range of the Western honeybee looks like this. Although they likely originated closer to this area, cave paintings in both Spain and France have been found depicting humans collecting honey from beehives. The first evidence of actual domestication comes from Egypt, where tombs have been found with images of beekeeping from around 9,000 years ago, which is crazy because beekeeping suits wouldn't be around for another 7,500 years. They were only invented in the 1500s, so yeah, for over 7,000 years, people took care of bees with nothing or close to nothing. Which I don't find that surprising at all. I mean, the amount of things that they had people do, I mean, building stuff, the pyramids, even though I heard they weren't even built by slaves. I don't know how true that is. I like but yeah, making people in the past get honeybees or get honey from bees without suits is the least surprising thing. 7,000 years, people took care of bees with nothing or close to nothing, which I like honey and all, but overall doesn't seem worth it. That's about it for livestock. Let me.
overrated, I think. It's good, but it's not something that I'm like, oh, this is so good. You know what I mean? Ooh, no, look if at that you'd like to see another video, maybe about our grains, vegetables, or possibly even pets. As always, thank you to my patrons for helping make this video and this channel possible. If you want to get your name up here like these generous people, I got a link coming up for you. Of course, you should subscribe if you like this, and if you haven't yet, maybe you should check out my videos on where spices and fruits came from. I'll be back soon with another one. Thanks. Thanks for making. All right, guys, interesting. Um, really cool. Hope you learned something or can teach me something in the comments. And I hope you guys are having a good day. See you guys next time. Bye, everyone.